very good morning. This is uh, the session uh, at Ecology, and uh, I think we can regard this uh, this session as uh, in one in one element. It's a continuation of the wonderful talk of uh, even Montoya, but actually moving from plants in phase one and preclinical study to to reality. I'm talking about uh, long acting. Uh, uh, opiate agonist treatment. So it's, uh, it's really a new reality that we're facing. And so it's very interesting to hear this. On the other hand, I think it's a great contribution to, uh, to the late Mary Jane Creek. Uh, I think she always had a very ambivalent relationship to new things, things new compared to methadone. I once heard expressing that the heroin existed treatment, she said that the only place where they do it well is in the Netherlands because they also give methadone. And so I basically think about heroin assisted treatment as a uh, heroin assisted uh, methadone maintenance treatment. So I think she would have uh, mixed feelings about these developments from buprenorphin and now from buprenorphin to these long acting medications. But at the same time, I, I'm sure that she also believed in, in progress and to find the best ways for, uh, for her patients. So uh, it's with uh, that in mind that I would like to open this, uh, this session. So it's really a tribute and a continuation of what uh, is currently going in in the United States with uh, new developments. Here we're talking about uh, new developments that uh, are in place or will be soon in place. And we have some excellent speakers uh, this morning. They will have uh, 15, 20 minutes for their talks. And then after that, we will have an overall discussion because the talks are very close to each other. They give a lot of details. And so we can discuss it in, uh, in one go. So let's start with the first presentation. The first presentation is uh, by Frank Gray. He is uh, the head of the, uh, the International Medicine Development of uh, Indivior. Uh, he is located in London, and he's talking about uh, sublocate long-acting buprenorphine from the clinic into the real world. Frank? Thank you, Wim, and thank you for the invitation to speak at the meeting. Really appreciate it, especially in such beautiful surroundings. My talk will start, most of it is new data, a little bit of previous data you might have seen, and a lot of the data I'll be presenting is about to be published or in, in final data. Just to say, as my conflict of interest, all the studies were funded by Indivio, some were sponsored by Indivio, and I'm an employee of Indivio. So just the introduction to, to introduce you to Sublocade. It's a once a month long acting subcutaneous buprenorphine formulation. It is approved in many regions, but I want to make it clear it is not yet approved in France. Sublocade is dosed in most patients after they've been on a transmucosal period of transmucosal buprenorphine and then two 300 milligram doses followed by 100 milligrams. That dosing regimen gets us to therapeutic um, doses from, from the start. And we've done some studies to show that that blocks the positive subjective effect of opioids. And some patients that need higher buprenorphine concentrations may be maintained at the 300 milligram dose. And then sublocate should be part of a, a complete treatment plan that includes counseling, psychosocial um, interventions to help with deconditioning of patients. So I'm going to start with some of our long-term data. The first part would be an integrated um, data from our phase three development program, which shows data up to 18 months. And then we'll look at what happened to our patients after they left our development program in the recover study. This is just an overview of our phase three development um, program. The first study is a was a double blind randomized study where we randomized patients to two doses or sublocate to 300 maintenance of 100 maintenance and placebo. Patients that finished that study could then roll, start the next study for another six months. And these are the patients we call the rollover. So they went from the first study into the second study. We also had patients that started specifically in that study, which we've called on the slide, the de novo patients. So once all the patients had 12 months of treatment, they could roll into an open label extension for another six months of treatment. And what I'll be sharing with you is the combined analysis from the 18 months worth of data. So first, just to start with the efficacy results, what you can see on this slide 
is an observed um, analysis of patients that remained on treatment and what happened to the abstinence. And what you can appreciate over time, you have an increased rate of abstinence up to the 18 month time point. As you can see in the box, the likelihood of being abstinent in our analysis increased by 12% for every six months that patients retained in treatment. Also want to share the safety data. So for patients that were retained in treatment, these are the proportion of patients that were experiencing adverse events. And you can see at the start of treatment, we have the adverse events and that gradually decreases over time as patients are retained in treatment. So patients being retained in treatment, having an increased um, abstinence and a decreased burden of side effects. Now to move on to the recover study, which I don't have lots of appreciation for. So the recover study was really a way we wanted to find out what was happening to our patients after they finished our clinical trial program. So in, in a more controlled environment, moving into more of the sort of real world and, and, and you know, interacting in normal. So the pool for patients were from the 844 patients that completed our phase three program. We had 500 of those patients included in the recover program and we followed them for a period of two years. And we've recently just had data on a, an extension of that through the um, Virginia Commonwealth University or VCU, where they've looked at the same cohort two years after their last recovery assessment. So we now have data on this cohort for up to four years. Just to orientate again, patients could enter the recover study after they finished the 12 months of treatment. So there were some patients in the recover study that were also in the extension study. So the data I'll be showing you on the next slide will be the 18 month data for everybody after their last treatment of sublocate. So the 18 months after they exited the treatment program. And the type of analysis we had was looking at their substance use, their lifestyle, quality of life, health initiatives, and also some social measures. So you, I mean, a few years ago, we presented at HS the, the 12 month data, and we see similar trends in the 24 months data. So the first to say is in the full cohort, 18 months after their last, they came out of the study, just over 46% of patients were still abstinent or self-reported, no use of opioids for that full 18 months. The data in the line graph is showing you at each assessment, patients were self-reporting their previous 30 days of, of opioid use. And you can see, 64 to 72% of patients at each visit were, were free of opioids in that analysis. We further wanted to look, which is the analysis on the right, what was happening to patients who had longer periods of treatment duration. What you can appreciate from the bar graphs is the patients with the longest treatment duration had the highest um, reports of sustained abstinence for the full 18 months. So for patients that have been treated up to 18 months, 18 months later, 62.5% of them reported abstinence for the entire period. And that was 52% for those that were treated for 12 months and those that were treated more than six months, 47%, which we thought was, was really interesting showing this duration of treatment along with the psychosocial care and maybe start sticking to things like behavioral or changes in conditioning. I just want to touch on the recover um, study. This is for 4.2 years after the last recovery assessment, but roughly two years after they left the recover study. We had just over 200 patients, 216 that contributed data. As you can see in that period, since their last recovery assessment, there were 45% um, of patients that had used opioids in that period, meaning 55% had not. Um, and you can see the most common opioid there was heroin, but we're also starting to see more polysubstance abuse, the emergence of, of methadone, uh, I mean, sorry, fentanyl use. And also you can see some patients were still in, in therapy or either on methadone or on buprenorphine. The interesting bit with this particular cohort is we also had the opportunity to in, uh, sort of review the impact of COVID-19 on their recovery assessments. So part of this, we had a specific question on their recovery and if COVID made their recovery more in, uh, difficult and 26% of patients did say that and it's just interesting in that 26% of patients they were the patients more likely to be using opioids in the recovery period 
And also an interesting, when we looked at what factors might be driving that, we saw patients with higher scores, depression scores, recent substance use or in treatment were more likely to say that um, they felt the COVID sort of situation was making the recovery more difficult. Just to say, this is the tip of the iceberg with this data, and there'll be more data coming out, actually analyz analyzing this, um, and there'll be more publications. So I hope you appreciate what we are showing is with longer term treatment, we're getting better abstinence use and also those patients are having their side effects. And also uh, an interesting cohort in the recover cohort showing what happens to patients after they've left and seeming to show that patients that were engaged in treatment longer were, were getting better outcomes and also some effects of, of COVID on that. So I wanna move from that just to show, focus on some of what we're calling high risk populations. And those are patients using fentanyl and all those that are injecting opioid users. So you may be aware there's much more fentanyl coming into the distribution chain, specifically in North America, lots of the overdoses are now driven by patients that are overdosing on fentanyl and that's driving an increase in the death rate. We previously published some work um, where we titrated, it gave intravenous infusions of buprenorphine to set plasma levels showing that you needed to be at levels above two nanograms per mole, and that might um, decrease the respiratory effect of using fentanyl. Done some more modeling on that and really shows us an interaction at the mu opioid receptor. So we have buprenorphine occupying the mu receptors. If someone uses fentanyl on top of that, that's reducing the amount of respiratory depression that they get. So we just pulled some interesting data from another study we did. The primary study we were doing was looking at initiating um, sublocate after a single dose of four milligrams of transmucosal buprenorphine. The patients were monitored for um, withdrawal, treated with transmucosal buprenorphine, and if they had no precipitated withdrawal or adverse events from the buprenorphine, they could go on to be injected. The interesting thing in this population was um, that of the 26 patients we enrolled, 20 patients tested positive for fentanyl on their um, urine screens. More interesting was five patients of the 20 self-reported fentanyl use, which means the majority of patients being exposed to fentanyl were unaware of this. So we did a sort of a sub-analysis on that population just to see if we could expect in this population similar types of efficacy or safety data. You can see it's a typical population we would suspect from opioid um, use patients. So specifically looking at efficacy, you can see on the table on the left, after the first injection after a month of treatment, you still got high levels of opioid use and fentanyl use. But from the second month on of treatment, we see a reduction in that use, which is very similar to the previous data I've shown you. Similar with the adverse events, the profile we are seeing shown on the table on the right is similar to what we've seen with buprenorphine products in the past and also similar to what I showed before, where most of the adverse events were reported after the first injection and not after subsequent injections. Um, quickly moving to patients that are injecting opioids. And our interest in this came from a sub-analysis from our double-blind study. So just a quick reminder of that study, patients were inducted on sublingual buprenorphine, randomized to the two doses of sublocate or placebo. What we saw in this population was, sorry, yes. So this is just data in that subpopulation of injecting opioid users. So while sublocate worked in all patients, there was indications that those that were maintained on the 300 milligrams did better over time, both in retention and in opioid use. And that um, did map well with what we're seeing from a pharmacokinetic uh, point of view that those patients were the patients that were having higher levels of uh, buprenorphine over time. So that moves us to a real world study. I just wanted to sort of set that up. So we've done a, a real world study in Canada and I've got a little bit more data on the study in my subsequent files and real world detection. But this was a study in patients, 140 patients treated by seven physicians across Canada. It was a retrospective chart review. 
one of the measures of interest was um, patients with overdose. Luckily, most of those overdoses were, were non-fatal, um, but could quite easily have been fatal. So what we can see from this is it's not only um, an indication that long-acting buprenorphine might have a, a sort of uh, benefit on overdose rates, but specifically all the overdoses we saw in the study were in patients that were using um, were, were in, uh, opioid injecting users. So just to summarize that, you know, we looked at fentanyl patients just to show they get similar types of efficacy and safety as we would um, anticipate. So now maybe more interesting, some of the real world data. So what I've shown you what we've seen in the clinic, what we see in real, in real world and real practice. The first study we conducted in Australia, um, we sponsored this, but uh, we funded this, but it was sponsored by NDOC in Australia um, and it's their data analysis I'm sharing. We recruited 100 patients from seven sites in Australia. CoLab stands for Community Long Acting Group in Orphine, and they were interested to see if there were differences in different treatment settings. Interesting data, what we saw in the real world is higher retention rates than we saw in the clinical trials. And those for you that have experienced with the long acting atypical antipsychotics, you may not be surprised by that, but you see 86 percent retention at six months and 75 percent at 12 months more interesting is, is is the forest plot so what we see there is is, is the the odds per month of treatment um, of decreased or increased use and you can see of all the sort of drugs of abuse uh, illicit drugs except for cocaine there was a reduction in use month to month you can specifically appreciate the reductions in craving heroin other op opioids also to pull out the reduction in injecting um, use, and also just to show that those patients were 60% more likely for each month they were in treatment to um, be in employment. The next, once we advance, I can share the data from our Canadian study. So there's a little bit more on the, the patients I showed you before. It's an open label multi cohort retrospective study, sort of doing chart reviews of patients with six months, and we included patients that had received any opioid agonist. So that included um, extended release buprenorphine, sublingual, or transmucosal buprenorphine, and methadone. You will appreciate from this table more of the methadone patients had a, a longer term opioid use history, as well as higher levels of injectable opioid use. Uh, and because of that, maybe not surprising, higher levels of HCV use. The actual history of prior reported overdose events was similar across the, the groups. And the patients in the extended release group and orphan and methadone were more likely to have come from treatment. So a little bit more granular detail on that, looking at um, adherence or retention. So adherence being the patients having more than five months of treatment with retention being them have been on same treatment for six months. You can see good levels of adherence and retention for both methadone and um, long acting buprenorphine. There's non fatal overdoses in the um, long acting buprenorphine group, the methadone. Um, the chart on the left showing you the retention rates. But interestingly, is the pattern of overdoses that we were seeing in this particular cohort. So if you focus on the methadone cohort, again, you might not be surprised to see that a lot of those overdoses or patients were overdoses were on treatment initiation. But you can also appreciate as those patients stay in, they're still having um, overdoses in those first six months. Reduced number of overdoses in sublingual buprenorphine group, similar pattern, and then the one case for extended release buprenorphine. So just to conclude on that, we've got some um, interesting preliminary results and real world data. I just wanted to say that the Australian cohort, we have shared 12 month data, that cohort's ongoing and we'll be getting 24 months data from that cohort later this year. And if I'm fortunate enough to be invited back, maybe I can share that next year. Um, and also from our Canadian experience, showing uh, a potential benefit, looking at the, the sort of baseline imbalances, we really need to run a validation cohort. And I just want to confirm that that study is ongoing. So we are looking at that validation cohort, a bigger cohort of patients that will be more balanced the baseline to see if that reduction in overdoses um, holds. And Vim will be happy to <laughs> say I'm done. <laughs> and I'll be happy to take questions afterwards. Thank you, Dr. Gray. And now, next speaker, 
Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, so my name is Freddy Tiberg. Uh, Merci beaucoup. Je m'appelle. Head of Cameras, which is uh, the company behind the development of Buvidal. So, uh, of course, I'm conflicted, as you understand. Um, but I am hoping this is a development we have been working with over 15 years. And of course, it covers a number of different studies. But here I will talk about uh, the patient experience. So, we have performed a study um, in Australia together with a large group of excellent clinicians where we looked at how the patients perceive this treatment. So that's that's the focus of my presentation. I'll try to be quick. Um, but before I go to the next step, I must say it's great to be back in France. It's great to be relieved from uh, all the whatever COVID things and um, fantastic to be in Biarritz. So moving forward, I think, can we get the next? Oh, that way. Just a quick introduction. So this is a different depot technology to uh, what was presented in the previous call. It's a subcutaneous depot injection uh, of buprenorphine. It's referred to as a trade name is Buvidol, uh, and it's also referred as CAM 2038. So this is a uh, ready to use solution, basically in a small dose volume varying from 0.15 to 0.64 milliliters. So that is injected under the skin um, and subcutaneously it can be injected into multiple sites into the buttock, abdomen, upper arm and thigh. Once injected, this is based of a, a lipid uh, composition. So lipids is like cell membrane uh, building stones, for instance. This is a combination of two different lipids and once injected into the subcutaneous tissue, it comes in contact with aqueous media there, it immediately transforms into a liquid crystalline gel. So basically what happens is you, you know, it goes from a liquid to something like a green pea uh, under your skin. And then uh, that uh, depot is then slowly biodegraded degraded over time. And the reason we developed this was uh, we, we looked at how is buprenorphine used in the current clinical setting and we tried to adopt that into uh, all of those years of experience into this deeper product. And to be able to have it as an individualized treatment, we developed two durations, one weekly and one monthly. And you can see here, uh, this is uh, population pharmacokinetics showing the daily PK profiles when you take the monthly. And uh, the absolute levels can then be varied by varying the concentration. So we have different concentrations of monthly and or different strengths of monthly and weekly products. So that's the product that we will be discussing today. And I'm hoping this guy can help me. Is there somebody here that could? Oh, there we go. Of course, there is a a lot of evidence behind this that we have produced uh, through the clinical trials up to registration in, in Europe, uh, Australia, uh, and, and the UK at this point. We have demonstrated, as you can see in these articles, and, and I'm happy to please to, to uh, provide these to you if you're interested afterwards. Uh, we have shown uh, effective suppression of withdrawal and cravings uh, and in several different studies and different types of populations. Um, we have done a study of blockade of opioid effects, uh, which demonstrated full blockade of opioid effects from the first weekly dose. In this case, it was 24 milligram. And that can be seen in, in this JAMA psychiatry paper. And then of course, uh, worked and presented pharmacokinetic backgrounds. Um, in our pivotal study, we studied head to head against sublingual buprenorphine um, the uh, opioid use in those in two populations, they were all new to treatment patients. And then they were treated over six months. And there we were able to demonstrate both non inferior efficacy and superiority on the secondary first secondary endpoint. Uh, throughout studies, we have had high retention rates and uh, the safety profile has been comparable or to buprenorphine um, and sublingual buprenorphine, except for mild 
to moderate injection site reactions. So now over to the topic of this presentation. So um, with our uh, great clinicians, we conducted a study, we, it's called DEBU, the, DEBU, the Depo Evaluation Buprenorphine Utilization Trial. Uh, it was published uh, this summer, so you can read it here, but the reason I have this here is just to acknowledge the authors here. Um, Nicholas Lintzeris, Adrian Dunlop, Paul Haber, uh, Dan Lubman, Robert Graham, Sarah Hutchinson, uh, and others. Um, uh, and I think that's the main contributors, of course, to this paper. And then we also have some contributors from the company cameras here. So the study design was a randomized multi-site uh, active controlled trial of depot uh, buprenorphine versus standard of care in Australia, which is then sublingual daily buprenorphine in this case. Uh, and I, I would say most patients there are using the suboxone film. So, so there was a high uh, amount of suboxone film treatment there. The primary endpoint was uh, patient reported. Um, so the treatment satisfaction questionnaire for medication, it's a validated uh, um, questionnaire. And the primary endpoint was the global satisfaction score. This tool is divided into four different domains. And then the secondary endpoints was um, treatment effectiveness. So reported by the patient, convenience uh, reported by the patients and side effects. And in addition to that, we had multiple other uh, patient reported outcomes in terms of treatment burden, quality of life, opioid use behaviors, etc. Uh, and as you can see, we uh, screened the randomized patients that were currently on treatment with buprenorphine or alternatively new to treatment. Actually, um, the study ended up with only having uh, patients switching from treatment of sublingual to uh, weekly and monthly depot. So you can see they were randomized. The sublingual group were using flexible dosing up to 32 milligrams, so a little bit above um, the standard doses here in, in Europe. Of course, there are approved doses in Europe um, due to the Australian tradition in this regard and, and, and uh, guidelines. And the weekly uh, depot was administered once weekly, the monthly uh, once monthly, and you had this dose range as you see on the slide here. So I'll try to move a little bit quicker. This population, we had 120 adults, 17 men, uh, 49 women, six outpatient uh, sites in Australia, intervention, 120 were randomized, uh, 119 received treatment because one patient in the standard of care group um, uh, dropped out before getting his first dose. Looking at the demographics, you can see them here. Uh, age, average age is around 45 years, so, so relatively high. Um, and you see the distribution between males and women. Um, very uh, similar. There were more hepatitis um, uh, medical history in uh, the depot buprenorphine group, most likely because uh, through the randomization, there were more heroin users in the depot group than in the sublingual group. That was a chance happening. Cravings in these patients were relatively low as they were on treatment uh, when they entered to study. Let's see if I can get this one moving. I had missed one side there. Um, so this just shows the, uh, uh, the rest of the demographics, the opioid use history, where you can see that there were more heroin users uh, entering the study in the depot group. Um, and you can also see there was a lot of concomitant drug use, amphetamine, cocaine, cannabis, etc. So then looking at the primary endpoint, which was then the pre-specified uh, uh, treatment TSQM global satisfaction score, you can see that there was a clear favoring of the depot treatment among the patients, uh, which was statistical, of course, a p-value of 0 0.01. Uh, 
um, and uh, yeah, the confidence intervals was well within that margin. So moving it over to a more maybe better presentation of the data, you can see the primary endpoint on the left hand side, the global satisfaction score. So when the patient came in the baseline value at week zero, they are fairly similar. And then you can see after week 12 and week 24, there is a significant treatment difference uh, uh, between the depot treatment and the sublingual daily medication. Um, and this is also seen in the convenience score. We actually had a week four data and the convenience data was statistical from week four, whereas the effectiveness score, which is the perceived effectiveness by the patient, continued to increase uh, up to week 24. And we don't have data after that, of course. Okay, sorry. I'm very sorry about that. Um, so that was the effectiveness score. And then we have the side effects. So that's the perceived side effects by the patient. And you can see that there is basically no difference. So side effects were the same in the view of the patient based on this uh, protocol. So this was the primary readout, patient satisfaction. We also had a further patient satisfaction um, uh, tool in the study. Also was significant in terms of treatment difference. But then we looked at a few other uh, interesting things, including the patient global impression of improvement treatment burden, so the burden that was perceived by the patients and the, the quality of life of the medication. And you can see that in all these cases, uh, the depot uh, treatment came out as positive, um, treatment burden, and also the opioid substitution treatment of quality of life, which uh, there was only one subdomain that was statistically significant, but uh, the other data also favored uh, the depot treatment. Looking at study retention, you can see that uh, there was high retention in both groups, so no difference. And I think it's worth noting that patients who passed the uh, 24 week of treatment, they were offered, those that were in the sublingual group was offered to transfer uh, over to the um, depot treatment. So, so that is, of course, confounding of the data in this case. But overall, high uh, retention. And I think one important aspect uh, here is also what kind of doses did these patients stand on? And you can see that here is a summary of uh, the weekly and monthly doses that uh, over the dose range that we were studying. And as you can see, um, patients really used different doses from the eight milligram weekly dose. Eight milligram is of course a very low weekly dose compared to uh, the standard dose of 60 milligram oral buprenorphine, but it still was sufficient in these patients to continue. They did not, uh, uh, all of them did not um, dose escalate. And as you can see also in the monthly uh, dose group, there was a variation between the 64 milligram dose and the 160 milligram dose. Overall, maybe Australia had a little bit higher doses than, than we see in other regions, but uh, I think it's quite representative. Uh, and then I also touch upon another point is that uh, there were some patients that re received a supplementary dose. You could have an eight milligram supplementary dose. Uh, but uh, 20 patients out of 60, but 15 of those, so almost all of them only received one single supplementary dose. Um, and uh, one client used four doses. So they were freely available in the study. Next slide. So uh, safety tolerability. Uh, consistent with sublingual buprenorphine, you can see that both groups had similar ones. What we did see, and uh, of course it's natural because we were um, very eager to look at this data, is, is some injection site reactions, which were mainly mild and some moderate. So in conclusion, um, to this, uh, what we saw in this study, which was focused on patient reported experience, this was um, that the study met the primary endpoint of um, 
the TSQM, so the Treatment Satisfaction Questionnaire for Medication, the Validated uh, uh, Questionnaire, for global satisfaction at the end of the study. It also showed uh, significantly uh, higher treatment satisfaction for effectiveness and convenience with no difference in the safety domain. And we also, of course, showed the improvements in the patient global impression of, of uh, improvement, reduced treatment burden, and improved quality of life for patients. Uh, and we also saw some interesting signals in the opioid-related behaviors, so relating to aberrant use of, of opioids. Um, as regards to the traditional opioid use outcomes, there were no surprises in the study. Um, and um, uh, if you're looking at the illicit opioid use, for instance, there was very little in this population uh, overall. So this is really focused on, on the patient experience. Um, I think what is interesting here is to see how, how this uh, learning about patient reported outcomes can be used in, in treatment practice in the future. And um, with that said, I should move towards the end of the presentation. I do want to thank uh, all the staff and clients that participated uh, in this study, um, in the services, and, and you can see the names here. And again, uh, a large thank you to our great clinicians um, and researchers, um, and also to the uh, network of the New South Wales Alcohol Clinical Research and Improvement Network. With that said, BRITS is great. Uh, I come from Malmö, so I had to take a picture uh, uh, and uh, show it's a, a reasonable place as well. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Chibiari. Thank you, Frederick. Uh, we'll, we'll come back for questions uh, at the end of the session. So now I call for Adrian Dunlap. I hope he will be there from Australia. It's probably quite late there. So let's see whether it works. Adrian? Yeah, I'm here, I'm here. Hello, bonjour, bonjour. Adrian. Oh, okay, look. Hi, Adrian. Bonjour, comment ça va? Oh. Bonjour. Bonsoir. Uh, bonsoir, bonsoir. <laughs> uh, okay. So, so, Thank you for being with us here in, uh, in Biarritz. It's, uh, it's wonderful weather here. Um, and we're having a great conference. And so we're very happy that you could join us from, uh, from Australia. So we, you have about 15 to 20 minutes for your presentation and we will have uh, a discussion questions at the end of the, uh, the session. So please uh, start your uh, presentation. We're most curious. Sure. So, um, can I check? Um, you can see the presentation? Not yet, but I see something is happening. Yeah, maybe. Yes. You're going to. Hello? We see it. It's wonderful. Thank you. It's your turn. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, merci. So, um, following on from Frederick's presentation, I'll talk to you about a study of um, depobuprenorphine, um, Buvidal, CAM 2038, uh, in prisons in New South Wales in Australia. Um, to start, I'd like to acknowledge the co-investigators, um, particularly Dr. Nick Lanzeris, um and Jill Roberts. Uh, the study was funded by New South Wales Health and cameras provided depobuprenorphine for the study. Uh, of course, um, opiate treatment is very important in prison and after release from prison. And in particular, it's important because there's a protective effect, a very strong protective effect on reduction in overdose uh, of people who leave from prison if they're continued on opiate treatment. Unfortunately, in Australia, there's uh, inadequate treatment in prison. There's not enough treatment in prison. The number of people in prison has grown uh, one third in New South Wales. 
but treatment has not grown alongside this increase in the people in prison. And so there's a under response, a lack of response uh, of not enough treatment occurring. Uh, so we were interested in looking at the safety of buprenorphine in prison. Uh, now this, this may not make a lot of sense in France, but um, in Australia, there's a very significant problem with diversion of suboxone in prison. Um, suboxone is uh, administered in a supervised setting in prisons in Australia, but there's still um, a big black market of illicit non-prescribed suboxone in prisons in Australia. In fact, it's the, it's the biggest drug, the, the most common drug that's used uh, in prison, more than cocaine or methamphetamine or, or heroin or other drugs. It's, it's the most uh, commonly drug that's used non-medically. So we were interested in looking at what happens if depobuprenorphine was introduced in prisons. Um, to be included in the study, patients had to have an opiate use disorder uh, and there were not very many exclusion criteria. Pregnancy uh, was one, um, having a um, mental condition that uh, meant that patients couldn't give consent was another. So it was a, a, a case control study. There was a control group of patients who were already on methadone, who were already stabilized on methadone. The patients that we offered depobuprenorphine were people with a history of opiate dependence, but they were not currently on treatment. So they were in prison, had opiate dependence in the history, but not currently receiving sublingual buprenorphine or any other treatment. And the study occurred in seven prisons across um, New South Wales, a mix of different levels of security, low, medium, high security, and male prisons and female prisons. Methadone treatment was typically high dose methadone, usually 80 milligrams or above. Uh, for the buprenorphine group, we gave them a single dose of sublingual buprenorphine, four milligrams to start, and then four weeks of weekly depot long acting buprenorphine, and then three months of monthly depobuprenorphine. Uh, and the doses could be adjusted up and down by the clinician. Um, the weekly doses and the monthly doses could be adjusted. So in the depobuprenorphine group, we assessed 80, 69 enrolled, and 59 people completed 16 weeks of treatment. In the methadone group, we assessed 79, 64 enrolled, and 60 completed 16 weeks of treatment. Uh, you can see the age, it's uh, typical of people in uh, prison in Australia, mostly men, uh, very sadly, many Aboriginal people, um, common to not finish uh, education, um, a higher prevalence of hepatitis C RNA positivity in the patients on the depobuprenorphine arm because they weren't in treatment um, when they commenced the study. Uh, in the findings, it was common for patients to port, report adverse events, but these were not severe adverse events. So there were only two serious adverse events of the patients on depobuprenorphine, um, and they were not related to the study medication. Uh, there were adverse events, but you can see there were mild adverse events. So things like injection site pain, constipation, swelling at the injection site, headache, redness at the injection site, but they were nearly all mild uh, reports, not, not moderate and not severe. We looked at diversion of the medication uh, and there were no reports of diversion, attempts to divert depobuprenorphine. Uh, this was objective and subjective measures. 
they continue to the study to be reports of diversion of sublingual buprenorphine. We looked at costs, so costs to the prison system and costs to the healthcare system in prison of depobuprenorphine and methadone. And then we had a third comparison group of patients on sublingual. And you can see the costs in Australian dollars um, were $140 approximately for one month of treatment for depobuprenorphine. $360 for methadone and nearly $1,500 for sublingual buprenorphine. And the main difference in the costs is for two reasons. The fact that depobuprenorphine is provided less frequently and then the amount of staff time, both for health staff and for prison staff is much less with depo compared to methadone and it's much more with sublingual. Uh, the retention in treatment was high. It was above 80%. Um, and the patients in the depot group who nearly universally reported using illicit buprenorphine, non-prescribed suboxone at baseline, reduced this dramatically across the treatment period. Uh, at baseline, they were using about 28 days a month, and this decreased to six days per month at week four and week 16. We also looked at the same measure that Fredericks just talked to you about, the treatment satisfaction questionnaire for medication. And it was similar to methadone across um, the different measures, the global scale and the measure of convenience. However, the measure of convenience showed uh, a benefit um, a small benefit of depobuprenorphine over methadone. The health staff uh, reported lots of reports of, of seeing this is very good, and you must understand that this is in the context of patients not previously being offered treatment. But also, interestingly, the prison staff also were very enthusiastic about this treatment and thought that um, it had a lot of advantages over methadone or sublingual buprenorphine. And it's uh, unusual to see prison staff so enthusiastic about a medical treatment for addiction. Uh, so our study did not find problems with diversion of depobuprenorphine even though we saw lots of adverse events, they were mild, retention was good, and drug use of patients not previously offered treatment uh, decreased very rapidly once they'd started on depobuprenorphine. And the costs of depobuprenorphine were less than methadone and much less than sublingual buprenorphine. Uh, this study has just uh, recently been published uh, earlier this year in May in the journal Addiction. I should also remark on a, uh, another important study of sublocate that's just been published in JAMA Network Open by Joshua Lee. Uh, and he looked at sublocate being started in, in prison, but the effects on release. So that's also good to look at. It, it shows that uh, retention is much better with depo than it is with sublingual buprenorphine. So of course, around this time, COVID, uh, or soon after this study was completed, COVID um, had an impact in Australia, and there was a potential very big problem with patients not being offered opiate treatment, be, being in prison, and prisons being environments where there's lots of concern about a lack of treatment and, of course, spread of COVID. Um, fortunately, our health department responded by providing more funding for depobuprenorphine treatment. Um, and you can see that the changes in the number of people treated. So this is the number of people treated in prisons in New South Wales. The, the yellow line is um, sublingual buprenorphine, suboxone. It nearly disappears early in the pandemic. The methadone is the blue line. It decreases by about half. Uh, and the gray line is depobuprenorphine, buvidal, it increases from being very small at the start to being over two thirds of treatment. So treatment expanded by about one and a half times during this period, which is very good in a situation of untreatment. Um, and our group is also now interested in looking at what happens to patients after they're released from prison. 
Um, merci beaucoup pour votre attention. Thank you very, thank you very much, uh, uh, Adrian. Uh, I hope you can stay with us for a while, uh, so we have the discussion later on. Sure. Okay, let's move to the final presentation today. And again, I'm uh, hoping that this will work. I'm calling for uh, Jan Malakar. Jan Malakar from Cardiff. Can you hear me? Jen, are you there? I hope so. Can you hear me? I can hear you, I can't see you yet, but uh, I think the people of the techniques are working on it. Fabulous. I've shared my screen. Hopefully they can see that. Is my screen shared or is we that? We don't see it yet. So I again call for the, yes, I see you now. Fabulous. You've got the whole screen and my face there. Yeah. Fabulous. Let's no, 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 I can't see your screen yet. <laughs> I can see your face, so. What do you prefer? Now I see a double face and a screen. Oh, fabulous. Okay, you can see me. Yes, I can see. Good, good, good. Okay, okay. you have 15, 20 minutes for your presentation, so looking forward to it. Okay, thank you. So uh, I've been very lucky in that it feels like I'm coming to this talk from the future about two or three years time because you've had all the slides showing success in the clinical trials and studies. I'm the person saying we've now got over 1,200 patients on uh, depobuprenorphine in Wales. This is our actual clinical experience. Normally this happened two, three, four years after, after release, after those sort of studies, but we've been lucky because of the pandemic. Uh, we were funded by Wales to just give Buvidal, which is the version of long-acting injectable buprenorphine available in in the UK at, at the moment to pretty much everyone and we have seen it as an amazing bridge to healing. I'd have loved to be there with you in person. I nearly got there but my son um, tested positive for COVID because there's a lot going around in Bristol. So um, I'm here in Bristol but nearly got to see you in Biarritz hopefully next year. So um, I hope I'm uh, presenting a very balanced view because if you look at my consultancy work, I try to work with everyone in the field um, and, and I continue to do so. And, and it's lovely um, after 25 years prescribing methadone and then 20 years of prescribing buprenorphine to have something new that really brings people to recovery. It, it really feels like all of them say, and I'll give you examples, but all of them say, you know, their daily opiate use is preventing withdrawal. It feels like they're drowning and coming up for air every day. And that's all they do with their lives. And then this Buvidal, the long acting injectable buprenorphine is like a buoyancy aid that just gets them to the surface. And over half of them just swim off and get on with their lives. And it, it's been a struggle because we as services are used to them doing badly you know the best you can do is be on a treatment or is your dual diagnosis worse are you still using crack cocaine are you still with social services have you gone to prison whereas how do we score you are at work you are doing well so I'm going to show you an example and then give you some of the data that's just piling out with what we know so uh, first of all here we go uh, next slide. Okay, this is Amy. This is a very typical patient that we normally see in our clinics. She's on 100 pounds of heroin and 100 pounds of crack cocaine. She was injecting in her neck um, and her legs because she'd run out of sight. Her legs were, were full of infection. She was regularly in ITU with heart valve problems because of that. She was regularly in prison. She was homeless. Um, she would remember, tell me that she would finish her sex working at 3 a.m. and make sure she walked down to the docks because there she could always buy a bag of heroin. She didn't care if she was raped or abused on the way. She would have that bag of heroin ready for her when she woke up in the morning because she did not want to suffer the withdrawal. Her mother, who... Um, 
I also spoke to and, and got the uh, health minister of Wales to talk to her as well, would say she would take Amy's photo round to the homeless agencies and the police so that when she was found dead in the gutter, they would know she was loved. And then she had Bouvardal and um, the change was remarkable. This, this, is, this is Amy. Um, <clears throat> she re-engaged within a week with her family uh, and her three children. Her mother was looking after them. Um, she started not one but two jobs. She totally stopped using any heroin or crack cocaine within that week. As you can see, she put on weight, returned to normal life. She um, found a fiance in one of her jobs. Um, they are now engaged. Um, they chose to become pregnant now. She is now uh, in her third trimester. She was initially um, immediately referred to social services to have the baby taken away. But social services after 20 weeks said, there is nothing to find. And we do not have the forms to say that she is well, she is stable, she is in one job now, not two, still paying her taxes. She's not been to prison, she is healthy. Uh, another interesting thing, going back to Ikro's talk at the beginning, she had lots of dual diagnosis labels and nothing, nothing in the last 18 months since she's been on the Bouvardel. She's come off the Bouvardel successfully and detoxed. Again, the detoxification was trivial and easy. We, we've now got a decent cohort of patients who've been become pregnant whilst on Bouvardel and then had the babies and following up Gabrielle Fisher's great work on buprenorphine. It's the same. It's as good. So that is Amy for us. I've called her Anne here as well. Um, she was injecting, as you can see, I'm just checking, I've covered everything. Yes, she's just moving on with her life. This is not the same person. This is why services and patients are so enthusiastic about it and why here in Wales we've started using it and now have approximately 15% of our patient groups across Wales on it. So what makes us feel enthused? Well, here's some, some of our early data that, that, that we tried to, to, to classify that, oh my word, isn't this amazing? We, we, we measured their clinical global inventory, which is a, a, an objective marker of how well they're doing. And, and right at the start, when you, when you scored them before their first dose of Bouvardel, it showed severe disease, at least. They scored five, it was, you know, Amy would score a six probably there. Um, and then within a week, the red arrow on the screen there, it dropped, they were much better. You know, how do you quantify? A week ago, I saw somebody who was homeless and, 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 and dirty and disheveled. And this week he's coming for his injection. He's wearing a hard hat, a safety vest. He's gone back to work on the building site because the foreman took one look at him and said, although I got rid of you two years ago because of your heroin use, you're fine, come back to work. This is sustained. We followed them up over six months with these measures. You can follow them up for longer. They're sustained. Um, if you get past the first week, we, we have about 90, 95% retention at a year. And we were lucky in Wales because we were given the opportunity to give it to everyone. So taking you through this busy slide, um, we've now got over 1,200 patients on Bouvardel in Wales, but it was a slow start. So um, bottom left-hand corner, we've got the approval in late um, 2019. And within um, a, a month, the first non-NHS patient was on it, but there wasn't much funding. The non-NHS could move fast because they don't have many meetings. We then had the first NHS patient at my service about four months later. That's because I found there was not one committee, not two committees, not three committees, but four committees to work through. But then luckily the bureaucracy just stepped back because COVID came along. And COVID was fantastic here, bizarrely. You had the Welsh government commissioners. We put a bid in saying, can we use Bouvardel? Because we don't want people picking up 
um, at the pharmacies. And they said, yes, use it on everyone. <clears throat> and so we could just keep on going. We had the first uh, prison patient um, a couple of months later with more and more use in prison. We finally, right at the end there, um, about four months ago, we finally had the first GP, the first primary care patient in the UK um, start on it. And as I say, we're, we're just keeping going because everyone is working together on this. So what do I mean by that? Well, we've had the proactive commissioning. There were the successful bids locally and into Welsh government. That proactive commissioning uh, generated a great collaboration. We worked well together. Uh, we tried to move things on. And because of COVID, the bureaucracy stepped back and instead of saying no, they said, please go ahead. So, so we could move at pace. The service had great flexibility. We could change things and move things on from the, the, the very mm, methodical and correct procedures to allow the FDA and the EMEA to say, this is a safe drug. We could change those quickly over the course of three to four weeks rather than the usual three to four years to move things on. So we had a look. And if you look at the steady state concentration, so this is some of Adrian Nick Linzeris's summary work of, of the doses that people have found. You can look on the left, there's the, the, the steady state dose range for 16 milligrams of sublingual buprenorphine. And we had um, CAM 2038 or Buvidal, and we could immediately see that the 24 milligram weekly dose and the 96 milligram monthly dose roughly fitted with 16 milligrams and 16 milligrams really is the right way forward for, for, for everything. So we looked and said, actually, we can pivot away from a small startup dose, some dosing over weeks. We were going, we need to move fast. We need to get these people out of our clinics because of COVID. And actually what we found was it was great. There were, there were no problems with that. We had an enthusiasm for changing. So we moved to, for example, uh, what, what I've labeled there as 42496, which translates as they had four milligrams of sublingual buprenorphine or supralingual, I mean, whichever one was there in the clinic. 20 minutes later, they had the, the weekly dose of 24 milligrams of um, sublocate, um, Buvidal. And then a week later, they had 96 milligrams of the monthly. We could adjust the doses. It was a pleasure. Um, seeing them, you know, giving that that dose, I, I would frequently come in, and even though I could get my juniors to do it, I still wanted to do it. So now I've, I think I've given over four hundred doses personally to over a hundred patients, because you see them that first week when you give them the twenty-four milligram. You explain things. You say, "I'm giving you a plaster on the site to reduce any infection because people scratch." Um, so if everyone gets a plaster, the, the infection or redness just reduces. And then you see them a week later. And my word, these are new people smiling, happy, turning up on time. The other, the other option we've got there, 2296, is in rural parts of Wales, we only see them uh, once a month because the, the site is 100 kilometres from the main base. So they would have had two milligrams of buprenorphine orally the day before, two milligrams on the day, and then straight to a monthly 96 milligrams. Fabulous. The uptake there is just uh, where I say 19 out of 19, 19 out of 19 of my nurses thought it was wonderful. They wanted to keep using it when we did an, uh, a study of them. They said, this is just fantastic. And it's a revolution. I, I really have to say that. My receptionists like it come in on time they smile they ring if they're running late this is unheard of in in normal clinics and just to to add some early data uh, around um, deaths we now have some services where half of the patients are on um, um, Buvidal and half are on methadone they're the people around prison prison release patient group and we just did an assessment of the last 13 deaths to go to the coroner. So that's been across that time scale when it's been half Buvidal, half methadone. And all of them were methadone deaths. 
you know, it's, it's if you're on Buvidal, you really, really struggle to properly overdose and end your life because it's a, a full opiate blocker. You can't have the opiates as the additional push for respiratory depression and death. Uh, uh, sorry, I've jumped a slide. Apologies. Um, another way of thinking about it is it's a, a, a bridge to recovery because of that. You've got your methadone and buprenorphine on the left in the land of dependence. The client is controlled by brain predisposition. We've all used buprenorphine as a fantastic detox agent. I developed a detox in a box thing with lefexidine in the past which worked very well you could do it in outpatients that was great people could climb over that molehill of detoxification but that four to seven year mountain of effort it was easy to slide down and back because people had their plan a of medicine for stress and didn't have a plan b what's what's oh apologies what's lovely i seem to have uh, pressed the wrong slide apologies there ah What's lovely is you've now got this long acting buprenorphine as a recovery bridge. It bridges over. People can stay in recovery and deal with their issues. Most people, because they have that buoyancy, they're no longer daily drowning, they just swim off. They go, I'm not spending all my time waking up going, how long till I run out? I'll just get on with it. Some need more work and some need a lot of work around their trauma, but they have the time and space and lack of anxiety to do that so that's that's lovely to see moving on so hopefully i've i've told you all of this we needed to adapt we needed to reduce the footfall we started off thinking it's a reduction of footfall that we need to do but we then found it was an amazing medication and rather than me tell you i'm going to use the words of some of my patients to say that. So these are, you know, honestly, every time I, I, I give someone an injection and say, what would you say about Bouvardel? They would say similar things. So I could trot out the same comments. You know, honestly, 15 out of 20 of pa my patients on Bouvardel are remarkable recovery stories. Instead of the on oral, you think of the one out of 20 that makes you come back to work every day because you remember they've done well. 15 out of 20 of these. Here we go. Methadone is just legalized heroin. The addiction is still running your life. A lot of addiction is just people, places and things. Bouvardel gives you the chance to get out of that environment into a totally different headspace. Another patient say you have less anxiety around going out. You're not worried about bumping into people who are actively using. You can't use heroin on top of it. Even if you wanted to get high, you can't. It's just amazing. Uh, I've had people describing trying to inject two grams of heroin on, on Bouvardel and saying, I might as well have burnt my money. And, and another thing, it's liberating. Taking tablets every day becomes part of a routine. Like heroin, it is still every day. But with Bouvardel, it feels medical. It takes away the addictive part. They're not craving. They're not waking up in the morning thinking, how long have I got? How long before I need to take my codeine, take my tramadol, take my methadone, inject my heroin? And this is the case across both the illicit opiates. And as I mentioned, the uh, non-illicit opiates we've got. We've got quite a emerging case series that this works well for anything, anyone on daily opioids where there's a problem. Here's some data on that, um, looking at um, 142 patients, nearly 25,000 days of patient data. I think we'll publish one, we'll, we'll revisit this and we, I think we've got 25,000 patient days, days of patient data. We were looking to see, is there a difference between the people starting and relatively stable on sublingual buprenorphine as per all the previous studies you've just seen? versus those starting on methadone versus those starting on heroin. And actually, they all did remarkably well, remarkably well. You know, if you look at these, these retention data, they, they look like the same smear, yet they're, they're meant to be patients starting on buprenorphine, starting from heroin, starting from methadone. And in essence, once you get past that first two doses, it's 90 to 95% retention. And virtually all of them will have no heroin, no opiates in their urine screens after the first month. They will, some of them will continue to use other, other, other substances, but in general, 
at a reducing level or completely stop. So it's lovely to see that. It's lovely to see in the real world this works. And it works by giving it very simply, as I say, one weekly dose straight to a monthly after that. No issues. Summary of the data, just to check I've told you, um, we've got over a thousand patients now. Really, we're seeing remarkable reductions in, in their dual diagnosis as, as per uh, the first patient. 80% have improved. It's, it's more than that. It's, it's, it's closer to 90, 95%. Just depend. We're just struggling to measure the numbers. 90 to 95% remain on treatment. It's got the same side effect if you move this. In fact, probably less side effects if you move to a weekly and then straight to a monthly or straight to a monthly if you're in a rural place. And this shift of doing it that way is routine for us now. Now, um, one other, a few other points to, to finish. Um, what have we got emerging wise? Well, detoxification, certainly longer is better. So here, how bad is it? Heroin, the withdrawal severity is terrible. And within a day or two, people always know they, 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 and they seek that. So Anne, who, who goes to the, who goes and gets her bag of heroin at 4 a.m. to make sure she wakes up, that's because it's horrible. Methadone, less so, but you need to be an inpatient. Buprenorphine, less so. You can do it in outpatients. But if you time shift this away and look at monthly, honestly, long-acting injectable buprenorphine, it's going to put a lot of the inpatient units out of business. You have a detox at about six to seven weeks afterwards. Some people don't even notice they've had any symptoms. Uh, we, we've stepped back and gone, we're telling you what's happening. We'll give you four days of well-being medications if you want, but quite a few people aren't even picking those up. So what else is there? It's been a game-changing step change uh, in some of the most entrenched. I mean, really, some of my nurses are going, can we put this person on Bouvedalian? Because they've been in and out of our service for the last 15 years. Let's try them. And, and they try them and... and well, a new person comes out because they suddenly stop that daily drowning and just float and off they go. And that stability, that that going back on the top of the sea of life and swimming off, that's what many just needed for recovery. Although some want to deal with their underlying traumas, there's significant dissociation in this group. So it's very difficult to deal with them in a like a PTSD clinic because they just run away from it. But my clinical psychologists love treating people with Bouvedal because they go, these people don't have anxiety, they're focused, they want to move on. So, so we're evolving a tentative tiered or stepped trauma focused approach. About half don't need anything virtually, they just need their dose. Um, one, two, one or two minutes. Cool. Detoxification is the dog that didn't bark. Pain is another dog that didn't bark. Um, and now why? Very quickly, buprenorphine, it's unique. These are slides from um, Steve Husbands, um, who worked with or did his um, PhD with John Lewis, who invented buprenorphine with his team way back in the 70s. They needed to discover what bu uh, buprenorphine, you know, they needed a compound like morphine, and they discovered buprenorphine. There it is in the middle. It's a <clears throat> mu opioid partial agonist and a cap antagonist. Bang. Because of that, you couldn't overdose on it pretty much. The blue line meant you could get a great response and higher doses plateaued, but therefore you could have that weekly or monthly. But with Bouvedal or Sublocade, is it that we're seeing the Kappa opioid antagonism? We're doing some research at the University of Bath looking at that. So allostasis is, is, is a way of getting activity over, over a long period, slow release. And is that finally giving you that Kappa antagonism, which gives you that reduction in anxiety and, and prevents dysphoria? I hope it is. So in summary, it's well tolerated, massive change in lives. It's, it's, it's not that more, much more expensive once you factor in uh, dispensing fees for the oral medication. I think it reduces offending behavior and, and best service changes and what to use. We're still working on it and tweaking it, but we're tweaking it in the context of everyone wants to use Bouvedal. It really stops the daily opioid despair. People have the energy to move into recovery. So almost you could say everyone on a daily opioid should try it because it could change their lives. 
here it's changed somebody's life dramatically, but she's just one of many. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Meritier. So we have 20 minutes for discussion. Thank you first to all the speakers for this very interesting uh, presentation. Buprenorphine is um, an effective treatment for opioid addiction. We all know that, but uh, how can we optimize its effectiveness and limit its misuse? Maybe this innovation will help us and help patients. Do you have questions for the speakers? Yes. Merci, Jean-Jacques Deglon. Je voulais témoigner. Thank you, Jean-Jacques Deglon. I would like to tell you how enthusiastic I feel. I feel that I'm lagging behind 40 years. I mean, we were the first ones to use methadone after this quick withdrawal uh, failures, after the use of different molecules. And all of a sudden, we find a molecule that shows fantastic results at the beginning. Uh, quick recovery, back to employment, stabilization of mood. And then, so we, we are enthusiastic our, as therapists. And I'm talking about 40 years ago, right? And of course, now I feel that there is quite a lot of advantages and quite a lot of future for this molecule. And I, I can perfectly understand this enthusiasm. Thank you for this comment. Another question or comment? Merci beaucoup pour vos présentations. En fait, Thank you very much for your presentations. I am not very familiar with this, but I, I still do not understand, since it is a revolution, but I do not understand why this is a revolution. Why is this such a big contribution compared to classic buprenorphine? I would like to know from a pharmacological point of view, why is this such a revolution. I mean, because in the first presentation, I mean, you have all appreciated the, the, the benefits of these molecules, but why? What's there? What is behind that? And what does the patient appreciate so much? I mean, why do you say it is a revolution? Hello, I can try to give uh, uh, at least some insight into that from our perspective. And I think, I mean, the idea of um, being, feeling normal, I think is, is something very important here. And conceptually, it's the fact that you have a, a constant level that makes and avoids uh, these kind of dips and ups and down during the day. And I think that has a profound effect there is another more complicated matter which has not been uh, addressed yet, and we don't really know if there is a difference, but if you give buprenorphine subcutaneously, basically you have 100% bioavailability and you have very little in terms of production of um, metabolites like norbuprenorphine and, and others. Um, and that's why you can dose much, much lower doses um, with the depot, if it is sublocate or, or if it is buvidol or whatever form. So you have much cleaner chemical profile uh, here, um, which is important. Um, but I think the, the profound thing, and maybe is something that um, uh, Dr. Melika talked about here before, is that uh, this stabilization uh, and being kind of not thinking about um, your next dose and not thinking about this repetitive behavior, that, that is probably a large impact. Want to add something? Yeah, no, I can echo 
all was said. I think that those are all good points. Um, I think buprenorphine has been available for a long time, and we've done lots of research in the clinic to understand where the therapy lies. So we now have products which can keep patients in the therapeutic dose range over the whole month. So you're not having moving in and out of therapeutic doses. You can consistently keep that. But what that does is it, it, it controls a lot of the symptoms of the disease, but at the same time is giving you an opportunity with your other treatment approaches to start sort of deconditioning lots of learned behaviors, which the patients will need to sort of carry on with their lives. So I think you have two things working very well together with these um, long acting options here. Can I add something uh, thank you. Um, to, to this? Um, hello? Yes, Adrian, yes. Yes, so, so uh, one more thing to add is if a patient is taking sublingual buprenorphine, any day they can choose to take it or not choose to take it. If they have depobuprenorphine, it's there. They can't remove it, it's there. Um, so it's a different commitment uh, to being in treatment. Can I, can I add as well? Yes. Yeah, I, I would say it started off, we all thought it was um, an evolution you know, weekly, monthly, this is much better, again, for what Adrian just said. But it then becomes a revolution for reasons we don't quite understand. But you see these patients just get up and get going and move on with their lives. And you go, at last, there is something that I can see helping these patients. And my receptionists see it, the nurses see it, their families see it, the patients see it. So there's something extra pharmacological. We don't quite know what it is, but it's 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 such a profound, quick change. It, it's wonderful to, to see. Um, I, I can guarantee if you give whether Bouvidal or Sublocade to two or three patients, you will also be as enthusiastic as us. Thank you. Next question. Yeah. Uh, I work in Brussels, I'm a GP, and I do use a lot of methadone, much more than buprenorphine. And I can see the interest of this product, especially for patients who are not yet stabilized with methadone for several reasons. For instance, I think of patients with neurological disorders who do not engage to take their daily pills, so they're having withdrawal symptoms because they have these kind of problems. So I think that it would be so interesting to shift to your product. Now, I don't see the interest when patients are stabilized. I don't know if anybody can tell me more about this. The first line treatment. Yes, um, I would say it's very much um, first line treatment now. Uh, we, we've moved certainly in some of our services to go try. In fact, no, 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 no. It's, <laughs> it's our patients are saying, I want. using for 15 years and never came to services. Try Bouvidal, it's been amazing. Can I have some? So it's moving to first line because patients are going, we want this. Now, how do you move patients from methadone, if they're stable, to uh, Bouvidal or something? That's quite easy. Um, really, uh, basically from um, oral buprenorphine, you just transfer straight over. From heroin, it's exactly the same as transferring to oral buprenorphine, whatever way works, you know, just get them. Uh, we do in our clinic four milligrams of sublingual or supralingual buprenorphine and 20 minutes to 30 minutes later, give them the injection, job done. From methadone, um, in Scotland, they reduce them down to 70 or 80 milligrams of methadone and then transfer. That's because they don't care because it's quite uncomfortable for two or three days. But they, they, the Scots don't care. Let's move on. Um, 
but we um, reduce down to between 30 and 50 milligrams of methadone. Um, and then when you transfer from that dose, again, similarly to transferring to oral buprenorphine, people experience one or two days of discomfort. And then they say, when they come back a week later, I have had five days of feeling brilliant doctor, best I've ever felt. And this is why I keep working in the clinic. Um, it's, so it's easy. Thank you. Thank you very much for this presentation. It was so interesting from a pharmacological point of view. It was pretty clear. We know that some patients make a ritual of their administration. And also, well, they sometimes have this fear of um, changing that ritual. So how to overcome this? Um. Thank you, that's a very good question. I think the most important uh, element is that choice for the patient continues, that the patient isn't forced to try depobuprenorphine or to make a change, it's the patient's choice uh, and they can choose and that's very powerful. Um, in, uh, at my clinic, we have uh, over a thousand patients and of all the patients on buprenorphine, um, more than half an hour on depobuprenorphine, and that's not our clinicians telling them to do that. It's the patients asking for this because they talked to other patients and they said this is much uh, much better for you, much easier. So don't uh, don't force patients to do something they don't want to do. Uh, oui, bonjour. Une question. So hello. Just to follow in the same lines as all the previous questions, I well, I'm so happy to hear about this new enthusiasm and this care for addictology. But I would like to, you know, to to be vigilant regarding all this, regarding the uses. Uh, the uses of other substances and the association with other substances. I know that, you know, with the withdrawal, if anybody is on new opiates, there's a kind of plateau effect, a determined plateau effect with buprenorphine. If we see the situation that we have around Paris, we uh, know that there is a lot of users who also take benzodiazepine and alcohol, and then it's not the same receptors that are involved. And for pre cabalin there's also difference. And we know that users may uh, use this in order to, to deal with all these um, interactions with other substances. So I would really like to know how it works here. And uh, what I'm wondering in this case is how to manage in case of overdose, if there's ever been one. I don't know if you've seen any of these cases because we do not have any control ourselves in our services of any other use. Knowing that buprenorphine does not respond in the same way as naloxone, and uh, it does not respond in the same way if it's intramuscular or intranasal. So what behavior should we follow if there is an error of administration? Because as far as I understood, this is administered by uh, healthcare professionals. But of course, what happens if we get the wrong dose? What should we do in that case? Not worry too much because actually it's so safe, you can't get to um, overdose levels. It, it's, you know, this is a thing that's been troubling the buprenorphine field for 20 years with people worrying about overdose and what you can give and can you give naloxone, can you give naltrexone, what about pain relief? And, and as I alluded to, it's, again, it's another dog that, didn't bark. We, we've never had problems in hospital with admissions because people are on oral buprenorphine and cannot have their pain treated. And as, as Mark um, showed earlier, um, you know, in, in, in several decades ago, the, the amount of people 
overdosing on buprenorphine is far smaller than those on methadone. And most likely, actually, that's buprenorphine in their system from several days ago. I can just reflect the last 13 um, people who died in our service were on methadone. Um, we haven't had them on um, the long acting. Um, we're just not seeing that. We're not seeing those overdoses. My patients test the blockade initially and they say, I've wasted my money. It doesn't have any effect. In, uh, and can I just add, in terms of, um, of other drug use, so Friedrich presented the data from the Australian study. So we didn't see any greater increase in use of benzodiazepines or stimulants or cannabis um, in the group on depobuprenorphine compared to sublingual buprenorphine. Your question is a very good question. All of our clinicians were worried, the doctors, the nurses were worried. If you have depo, you only see a patient uh, once a month. Is there going to be lots of other drug use? But we haven't seen it. It's, uh, it's not something we experience. Thank you. Oui, bonjour. Leon Hello from an association. I I have a philosophical question. I I think that well this enthusiasm related to the non pharmacological part of it is very important because new medication for patients means that well teams professional teams have to be enthusiastic about it and then uh, this is conveyed to patients and patients will decide what they need and uh, they even if they still take the same drug that they were using before heroin or other drugs. Now here, with the treatment with sublingual buprenorphine, they can stop this treatment and, and go back to heroin. Whereas with this long-acting release treatment, it is a bit more complicated. So I'm wondering, is this a uh, treatment that deters, just like alcohol treatments, are we going to to mm, threat uh, the patient's freedom, or how are we doing related to this? Because, well, we know that regarding retention with methadone, we know that it is better than with buprenorphine, but every time they come, patients come, and they, they want this treatment. So what kind of decision or what makes them move away from drug use? I don't know. This is quite a philosophical question. Give a very short answer. Um, one, the patients choose to come back every every time, every month. For the methadone, they say, we don't come back um, because we want to, we come back because we're in withdrawal. Secondly, in terms of clinic staff, actually, it's really hard to get my clinic staff enthused about anything new. They are ultra conservative, and it took six to nine months to get 19 out of 19 nurses enthused because they saw the actual results so it's patient-led the patients see it and see benefit and they turn up for the appointments by choice they're not in withdrawal all of them are telling me i'm here because it works for me and lets me get on with my life i'll stop there okay let's let's stop here uh we really have to stop I think this has been a very interesting uh, session. I've met very sessions where people were skeptic, and let's say skeptic scientifically, but also let's stay uh, enthusiastic for treating our patients. And 
there is new uh, new ways and uh, let's uh, see next year or the next ADHS what the, the result is in, in Europe. We're still enthusiastic. I get very enthusiastic about it and I hope and I see that you're getting enthusiastic. I hope that these medications are on, on the market in, in Europe very quickly and that we have a, another meeting in two years where we have more results and uh, more experience. So thank you very much for uh, uh, joining the session.